Section 20 of The Coming Race This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The Coming Race by Edward George Bulwer-Lytton. Chapter 27 One day, as I sat alone and brooding in my chamber, Tai flew in at the open window and alighted on the couch beside me. I was always pleased with the visits of a child, in whose society, if humbled, I was less eclipsed than in that of Anna, who had completed their education and matured their understanding. And as I was permitted to wander forth with him for my companion, and as I longed to revisit the spot in which I had descended into the nether world, I hastened to ask him if he were at leisure for a stroll beyond the streets of the city. His countenance seemed to me graver than usual, as he replied, I came hither on purpose to invite you forth. We soon found ourselves in the street, and had not got far from the house when we encountered five or six young jaye who were returning from the fields with baskets full of flowers, and chanting a song in chorus as they walked. A young gi sings more often than she talks. They stopped on seeing us, accosting Tai with familiar kindness, and me with the courteous gallantry which distinguishes the jaye in their manner toward our weaker sex. And here I may observe that, though a virgin gi is so frank in her courtship to the individual she favors, there is nothing that approaches to that general breadth and loudness of manner which those young ladies of the Anglo-Saxon race, to whom the distinguished epithet of fast is accorded, exhibit towards young gentlemen whom they do not profess to love. No, the bearing of the jaye towards males in ordinary is very much that of high-bred men in the gallant societies of the upper world towards ladies whom they respect but do not woo. Deferential, complimentary, exquisitely polished, what we should call chivalrous. Certainly I was a little put out by the number of civil things addressed to my amour propre which were said to me by those courteous young jaye. In the world I came from, a man would have thought himself aggrieved, treated with irony, shaft, if so vulgar a slang word may be allowed, on the authority of the popular novelist who used it so freely, when one fair gi complimented me on the freshness of my complexion, another on the choice of colors in my dress, a third, with a sly smile, on the conquest I had made at Apollin's entertainment. But I knew already that all such language was what the French call banal, and did but express in the female mouth below earth that sort of desire to pass for amiable with the opposite sex, which, above earth, arbitrary custom and hereditary transmission demonstrate by the mouth of the male. And just as a high-bred young lady, above earth, habituated to such compliments, feels that she cannot, without impropriety, return them, nor evince any great satisfaction at receiving them, so I, who had learned polite manners at the house of so wealthy and dignified a minister of that nation, could but smile and try to look pretty in bashfully disclaiming the compliment showered upon me. While we were thus talking, Tai's sister, it seems, had seen us from the upper rooms of the royal palace at the entrance of the town, and, precipitating herself on her wings, alighted in the midst of the group. Singling me out, she said, though still with the inimitable deference of manner which I have called chivalrous, yet not without a certain abruptness of tone, which, as addressed to the weaker sex, Sir Philip Sidney might have termed rustic, why do you never come to see us? While I was deliberating on the right answer to give to this unlooked-for question, Tai said quickly and sternly, Sister, you forget the stranger is of my sex. It is not for persons of my sex 
having due regard for reputation and modesty, to lower themselves by running after the society of yours. This speech was received with evident approval by the young Jaye in general, but Thais's sister looked greatly abashed. Poor thing! And a princess, too! Just at this moment a shadow fell on the space between me and the group, and, turning round, I beheld the chief magistrate coming close upon us, with the silent and stately pace peculiar to the Vrilia. At the sight of his countenance, the same terror which had seized me when I first beheld it returned. On that brow, in those eyes, there was that same indefinable something which marked the being of a race fatal to our own, that strange expression of serene exemption from our common cares and passions, of conscious superior power, compassionate and inflexible as that of a judge who pronounces doom. I shivered, and inclining low, pressed the arm of my child friend, and drew him onward silently. The tour placed himself before our path, regarded me for a moment without speaking, then turned his eye quietly on his daughter's face, and, with a grave salutation to her and the other Jaye, went through the midst of the group, still without a word. CHAPTER Twenty Eight. When Tai and I found ourselves alone on the broad road that lay between the city and the chasm through which I had descended into this region beneath the light of the stars and sun, I said under my breath, Child and friend, there is a look in your father's face which appalls me. I feel as if, in its awful tranquillity, I gazed upon death. Tai did not immediately reply. He seemed agitated and as if debating with himself by what words to soften some unwelcome intelligence. At last he said, None of the Vrilia fear death, do you? The dread of death is implanted in the breasts of the race to which I belong. We can conquer it at the call of duty, of honor, of love. We can die for a truth, for a native land, for those who are dearer to us than ourselves. But if death do really threaten me now and here, where are such counteractions to the natural instinct which invests with awe and terror the contemplation of severance between soul and body? Tai looked surprised, but there was great tenderness in his voice as he replied, I will tell my father what you say. I will entreat him to spare your life. He has, then, already decreed to destroy it? Tis my sister's fault or folly, said Tai with some petulance. But she spoke this morning to my father, and after she had spoken, he summoned me, as a chief among the children who are commissioned to destroy such lives as threaten our community, and he said to me, Take thy vril staff, and seek the stranger who has made himself dear to thee. Be his end painless and prompt. And I faltered, recoiling from the child. And it is then for my murder that thus treacherously thou hast invited me forth? No, I cannot believe it. I cannot think thee guilty of such a crime." It is no crime to slay those who threaten the good of the community. It would be a crime to slay the smallest insect that cannot harm us. If you mean that I threaten the good of the community because your sister honors me with the sort of preference which a child may feel for a strange plaything, it is not necessary to kill me. Let me return to the people I have left, and by the chasm through which I descended. With a slight help from you I might do so now. You, by the aid of your wings, could fasten to the rocky ledge within the chasm the cord that you found and have no doubt preserved. Do but that, assist me but to the spot from which I alighted, and I vanish from your world for ever, and as surely as if I were among the dead. The chasm through which you descended, look round, 
We stand now on the very place where it yawned. What see you? Only solid rock. The chasm was closed by the orders of Apalin as soon as communication between him and yourself was established in your trance, and he learned from your own lips the nature of the world from which you came. Do you not remember when Z bade me not question you as to yourself or your race? On quitting you that day, Apalin accosted me and said, No path between the stranger's home and ours should be left unclosed or the sorrow and evil of his home may descend to ours. Take with thee the children of thy band, smite the sides of the cavern with your vril staves, till the fall of their fragments fills up every chink through which a gleam of our lamps could force its way. As the child spoke, I stared aghast at the blind rocks before me. Huge and irregular, the granite masses, showing by charred discoloration where they had been shattered, rose from footing to rooftop, not a cranny. "'All hope, then, is gone,' I murmured, sinking down on the craggy wayside, "'and I shall never more see the sun.' I covered my face with my hands, and prayed to him whose presence I had so often forgotten when the heavens had declared his handiwork. I felt his presence in the depths of the nether earth, and amidst the world of the grave. I looked up, taking comfort and courage from my prayers, and gazing with a quiet smile into the face of the child, said, Now, if thou must slay me, strike. Tai shook his head gently. Nay, he said, my father's request is not so formally made as to leave me no choice. I will speak with him, and may prevail to save thee. Strange that thou shouldst have that fear of death, which we thought was only the instinct of the inferior creatures, to whom the convictions of another life has not been vouchsafed. With us not an infant knows such a fear. Tell me, my dear Tish, he continued after a little pause, would it reconcile thee more to departure from this form of life to that form which lies on the other side of the moment called death? Did I share thy journey? If so, I will ask my father whether it be allowable for me to go with thee. I am one of our generation destined to emigrate, when of age for it, to some regions unknown within this world. I would just as soon emigrate now to regions unknown in another world. The all-good is no less there than here. Where is he not? Child, said I, seeing by Tai's countenance that he spoke in serious earnest, it is crime in thee to slay me. It were a crime not less in me to say, Slay thyself. The all-good chooses his own time to give us life, and his own time to take it away. Let us go back. If, on speaking with thy father, he decides on my death, give me the longest morning in thy power, so that I may pass the interval in self-preparation. End of chapter 28